Today, I'd like to talk to you about ponds. In my opinion, ponds are the most relatable body of water, and they're also my favorite. A pond is so much smaller than an ocean or a sea, it's not ideal for recreation like a lake, and ponds are often overlooked, but I think that's a real mistake. A pond invites you to sit and spend time next to it in silence. And when you do finally manage to still yourself like the waters, you'll come to realize that they only appear to be still and empty. A pond is a portal to a world of monsters that you might not initially notice if you were taken in by the dappled sunlight dancing on the pond's still surface. There are some truly strange creatures wriggling around on the other side of the looking glass. A pond is basically a big puddle, muddy, lively, but still a relatively lonely geographical feature. There are an infinite number of ways for ponds to form, from man-made to melting ice, really wherever there's a hole that can gather and retain water, although some ponds only exist seasonally, filling up with the spring thaw. In order not to be a lake, a pond must be less than 12 acres, with no room for wave action. The water's surface must be still. To qualify as a pond, light has to reach the bottom. It must be shallow enough for the roots of aquatic plants to thrive. And these roots also prevent soil erosion and provide food and shelter to the pond's inhabitants. Even at a microscopic level, a pond depends on sunlight. There is a natural energy flow with the sun ruling over all. Ponds are a natural greenhouse gas sink and water filtration system with plants and microorganisms cleaning toxins and heavy metals out of the water and soil around its banks. Algae converts sunlight and nutrients and minerals into food for snails, bugs, and other small creatures. The bottom of the pond has very low oxygen, and only bottom feeders and decomposers dwell here, but there's still some sunlight. Decomposers, like bacteria, fungus, and scavengers, are nature's recycling and a very important part of this ecosystem, as creepy as they might look. Many animals treat the pond as a nursery, entrusting their eggs to the still warm waters that provide an almost womb-like environment. And although it is not without its dangers, there are many good hiding spots in the vegetation. An interesting fact about tadpoles is that they can sense when the water in the pond is drying up and they will actually develop into frogs faster. Frogs are really good at mutating to adapt and are also just like an environmental barometer. If you want to know what the weather is going to be like, just go ask a frog. A pond is a symbiotic community of organisms, many too small to be seen without a microscope. There are three types of organism in the pond, classified as producers, consumers, and decomposers, all essential to maintain balance and all serving an important function. If I were to label myself, I'd say I'm definitely a decomposer. In a pond, decomposers convert dead organic matter into carbon dioxide and nutrients like phosphorus, nitrogen, and magnesium, which fertilizes the plants and helps them grow. As a delicate ecosystem that requires balance, too many of these nutrients can lead to an algae bloom, essentially poisoning the water and life inside the pond. Without decomposers, it wouldn't be a cycle. What I love about ponds is that even the lowliest, weirdest creatures end up being the most important. It makes me think that there might be a place in this world for a weirdo like me. I was lucky enough to grow up with my bedroom window overlooking a little pond that my parents dug. They didn't line it, so it was rarely full to the brim with water. In fact, in the summer, it was more of a mud hole, but it was heaven to me. I spent my days on the banks of the pond, daydreaming and looking for weird bugs, poking things with sticks, and making swords out of bamboo. That is the life that I dream of returning to as an adult. I had a bug catching kit with a magnifying glass and an eyedropper, and I used to lay awake at night remembering the larval horrors that wriggled around in every drop of pond water. Even though the things I found in there were gross and gooey and had far too many legs, I couldn't stop looking. It was like an amoeba entered my brain and hypnotized me, and he's still in there, I'm sure. 
I think because I grew up in ponds and ditches, I won't swim where I can't see the bottom. I can't handle something I can't see brushing my leg underwater. I think about how goldfish can grow huge if set free into a lake, and it conjures up an image of larvae as big as dolphins. I think I would only like that if I wasn't swimming around with them. If I had to psychoanalyze my fascination with weird pond monsters, I think it's to do with the trope of the misunderstood monster. As a little girl with ADHD, it was easy to feel like I was a gross monster that was too much for everyone else to handle. I felt rejection so keenly that I felt like a monster, even if my intentions were good. For me, it was a moment of recognizing myself in Frankenstein's monster, being chased by an angry mob with pitchforks for just wanting a friend. I got so worked up watching the Elephant Man as a kid, convinced that I was in love with him. Like many other creepy little kids, I found solace in monsters. To me, a pond represents the beauty in the grotesque, secret, creepy, and uncomfortable. It's not the clear, cold lake that relieves the summer heat, but it's a great relief for the tedium of ordinary life, especially for a little girl that doesn't fit in. The water is not hospitable, and yet I'm still so drawn to it, still comforted by the muck. There are of course objectively beautiful things about ponds. The warm light beaming down into the mud below, water lilies, the iridescent dragonflies and kingfishers flashing in the sun, you have only to look at the Art Nouveau movement of the early 1900s to find out how beautiful pond elements can be when incorporated into art and architecture. When I first went off to university and left home for the first time, I was really homesick. I felt really out of place, like a fish out of water. So to try to cheer myself up, I would go for walks on the nature trails around my school. One day, past a field of skunkweed and into the woods, I came across a little pond no bigger than a food truck. Inside its shallow waters lived a giant snapping turtle, ancient and covered in moss and grass. He was like a living island. Obviously I didn't get too close, snapping turtles are terrifying. But I felt like he came to know me and we had a respectful understanding, just two introverts in the woods. I would go back there every day. I had something to look forward to after classes and sometimes in between. Soon I found other girls who were just as delighted as I was to sit next to the pond, and I can't tell you how great it was to share the secret of my turtle friend. Ponds have been a reoccurring theme in my life, appearing to me when I most need them, although perhaps I am subconsciously always seeking them out, especially when I am in need of comfort, like a little frog safe under a lily pad. We're so used to the idea of the beauty of nature being vast, awe-inspiring, great mountains and ocean vistas and open skies. But without access to these obviously picture postcard experiences, are we to be starved of nature's beauty? Forever pining over aesthetic photographs on social media of places we can only hope to visit. Maybe you feel like you live somewhere that is devoid of natural beauty. And believe me, I can relate. As someone who lives in a place called Chemical Valley, where the night sky pulsates orange and you'd be lucky to see a handful of stars. But a little trick that I've found to combat this is to adjust your scale to adjust your perspective. That way you can see both the whole and the parts, the forest for the trees and the trees for the forest. I've said this before in my gardening videos, but it bears repeating. Some of my favorite plants can be found in waste places. For example, I once discovered one of my favorite colors when sitting on the sidewalk in a 7-Eleven parking lot, eating a hot dog and a slushie. It was a flowering chicory, and it turns out that these plants are both edible and medicinal, as well as being beautiful. I actually hope to start some from seed in my garden this coming spring. The same goes for ditches. You'd be amazed at how some of the most beautiful flowers can grow at the side of the road. Plants that can heal us, or the earth, or both, grow even, and maybe even especially, in the forgotten places. Sometimes I'm guilty for not noticing things until I'm bored enough to go looking for them. And even then, with doom scrolling through social media to avoid boredom, 
I think I have robbed myself of that natural process of creative discovery. I often have to force myself to put my phone down and go outside, but ultimately it's always worth it, even if my outside isn't exactly a stunning estate or national park. A good pond is great real life entertainment. Just pick a dry spot and disappear into the vegetation like a leopard frog, who you'll never see, but you'll hear him splash if you get too close. If you shrink down to the microscopic level, the creatures in the pond only become more alien and fantastical. My favorite local big pond is technically a lake, because there are parts of it that are too deep for the sun to reach the bottom, but it still is very much a pond in spirit. One true thing about a pond, if you've ever had the misfortune of stepping inside it, is that the bottom is generally an illusion. You'll sink down like cartoon quicksand. There are boggy places where whole civilizations might have been swallowed down into some pocket between layers of the Earth's crust. Maybe one day I'll build a special diving bell and sink all the way down and chill out with the mole people down there. Hello, this is Mole Man in the Morning. Good mole man to you. Today, part four of our series of the agonizing pain in which I live every day. The fossils around here are all a record of the swampy sea that covered my slice of the world. And I think it's really only a matter of time before it swallows everything up again. I guess I'll have to put my house on stilts, or maybe just build myself a little houseboat. Give me an expanse of shallow sea that stretches out forever past the sky with no signs of civilization but lonely little islands of farmhouses and broken down barns. I used to imagine this, looking out over empty farmers' fields, like patchworks of tiny tundras broken up by clumps of bush, little forests that I wasn't allowed to explore. So I made do with a small grove of cedar trees by the ditch, with my imagination filling in the gaps, turning my little pond into an entire sea. I seem to have always been fascinated with the idea of a pond sea, imagining sailing around giant lily pads with a tiny ship. As I recently rediscovered my love for ponds again, suddenly a whole universe opened up from the depths of the underpond, as though I was remembering somewhere that I'd been in a dream in a different lifetime. A magical place with dragonflies as big as eagles and catfish the size of dragons. It was really hard for me to leave that pond and my childhood home behind when the time came. But the more distance between us, the more magical of a place it becomes in my memory. Perhaps it is kinder then to remember it as full of life and water than to return and find it nothing but mud and dirt. Now it gets to be something more. Sometimes I wonder if I got too big to appreciate the little things or my problems just got bigger. But I feel like the smaller you are, the bigger your problems, sometimes literally. Although you might not be able to see that, though there are also more places to hide the smaller you are. If all of your problems are an ocean, the vastness of them feel too great and overwhelming. But there is something reassuring about being able to stand up and see the whole thing, or to crouch down and focus on a tiny part, like with a pond. It's like playing Alice in Wonderland with your perspective. The strange, mysterious nature of the pond is mitigated by the fact that sunlight reaches the bottom. It's not as exotic as the deep sea trenches, but it's also not as if you're moving around blindly through the waters. The sun beams down warmth, and it's easier to map out a space that you can see all at once. You have a general idea of the shape of the way that you're going but the real fun comes in filling it all in, without having to worry whether you're going to fall right off the edge. I'm not that adventurous, at least not yet. My map is loosely based off my favorite pond. When I need some reference or just some general inspiration and fresh air, I like to walk around it, stopping often to check things out from a worm's eye view, trying to figure out where I'd build little animal villages. My phone is stuffed full of photos of old logs that would be perfect apartment buildings for frogs and toads, and plants that I want to reference as giant versions of themselves.
So go out there and find yourself a pond, or even a good ditch, and make sure to spend some time there each season to observe the creatures and the changes and just to appreciate these often overlooked bodies of water. I promise you that if you wear the right shoes, there's a whole strange world to be found there. Happy exploring, and thank you so much for watching.